Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lake Point Bible Church. It's good that you are all here today. Let me um, tell you a little bit about what's going to go on this morning in this service. You'll notice your bulletin is a little bit thick today. It's because there's a workbook in there. Um, we are talking today about the week of responses, um, how when different people heard about Jesus' birth or they met Jesus for the first time when he was a child, how did they respond to this Messiah that has come? And so every single one of our songs today is going to have um, a, some, some sort of a call for a response in it. Um, Dave was saying, I think this is the record for how many songs start with the word come or have come in the title um, in this sermon today, or, or uh, Sunday. So we're going to talk about each of those songs today. What's the calm response for us as believers when we hear the good news of Christ? So we're going to start with, Oh, come all ye faithful. And um, this is our, our call of come you faithful people and adore the king. Adore the Messiah, the one that is born. Born to save all of humanity. God in flesh appearing. So will you stand with us and come adore our king? Erin's going to lead us on this one so you can follow her lead. with some announcements for us. All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you haven't already, would you silence your cell phone so it doesn't go off during the service? And last night was our living nativity out front. It went great. Um, I'm just pleased with all the people who came. And uh, I do have a couple pictures I want to show you. There's Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. Um, Kaylee and Elizabeth reading. Um, there's the, uh, the adult angels doing sign language to Silent Night, and that's uh, Megan with her goat. 
And uh, Mary and baby Jesus, who was so good all night, he didn't cry all night, he was so good. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who uh, made this possible, all the people who set up everything and did the costumes and all the actors and people who did the fire and got the animals and, uh, and uh, the food crew that kept everybody fed. Anyways, thank you so much for catching the vision. This is what we, something we do for the community. And we had a lot of people last night that we didn't recognize, people from the, the neighborhood and fa you know, family members that you all brought. So thanks so much for making the Living Nativity uh, such a good thing last night. God gave us great uh, weather, and it was a good... Uh, it was different than some of you who are here, you know, it was different than past years, but some people said it was like even better. So anyways, I'm so pleased with that. Now, I do want to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. After this service, there's no Sunday school for either adults or for kids, but we are going to do this service project that you're invited to stay for afterwards, and we're going to make 200 sandwiches and decorate 200 cookies for a, a feeding program in at the City Covenant Church in Detroit, and they uh, make meals for people on weeknights, and so our sandwiches and cookies are going to go for the meal tomorrow. And so if you want to stay around and, and fellowship and uh, make some, uh, some sandwiches and cookies, please do that. Probably won't even take an hour, but we'll meet downstairs to do that. All right, and then you know uh, Christmas Eve, next Sunday... December 24th is Christmas Eve, so we will have church in the morning. There'll be the Lord's Supper service at 845, and then a 10 o'clock church service. There won't be Sunday school next week. Um, but in the evening, then, we have our Christmas Eve services. The identical services come at 430 or at 7. And uh, please invite family members and neighbors and coworkers, because there are people who uh, maybe they don't go to church regularly, but they're open to coming some, to something uh, from Christmas Eve. All right, the Eldridges are moving. Uh, Dave and Amanda, come on up here. Uh, they're moving to Traverse City for Dave's job, and um, we're going to have prayer for them. Here's Dave. You, did you leave your wife out in the parking lot? Or? She is down in the, uh, uh, with the kids, but giving them, putting them in the... In the gotcha. The Tell us uh, where you're going and why. Okay, um... I am uh, transferring, uh, really transferring jobs. Um, there's a new school up in Traverse City, uh, Legacy uh, Aviation Learning Center. And what I will be doing is I will be teaching, well, multiple, multiple different things, but teaching uh, future mechanics, aviation mechanics, um, as well as over the head of the, uh, the ed academic side of things, um, really, since I have experience in that area, they wanted someone who was here that had experience and understood what was good, what needed to be done. And then, uh, yeah, and the reason why, when I was younger, I I uh, gave my life to the Lord, and I and one of those things of. That when the Lord says move, I'm like, okay, when and where, and uh, how. W and this was an opportunity that I didn't go looking for. It came knocking on my door, and I says, Lord, I asked the Lord, is this what what you want? Um, the Lord has provided so many, so much, um, whether it's through through Lake Point here, or even as we're looking forward and going forward, um, we were able to find a house um, and have enough space for the us and the four kids, and uh, uh, they, the kids saw it yet, uh, two days ago. Oh, they saw the house. They saw the house, and they were um, right after closing, and they were ecstatic, and so it's... We're seeing the Lord move in ways that it's just boom, boom, boom. Things are lining up, and so. Let's tell them that they're, they're packing up this afternoon. Hey, come on up here. Um, you're getting a truck this afternoon. Yep. And if you would like to join me and some others in helping them pack up, they live in Westland, uh, ask them where they live, or uh, ask me, I can text it to you. After three. We're after saying three. After three, the truck will be at the house yep. if you want to come and help load. And then you're driving up tomorrow. Driving up tomorrow, uh, Amanda's going to stay here, stay in the area till Tuesday morning. 
Okay. Um, we may end up having to have an, another trip just to really finalize things, but the large majority of stuff, stuff moving is going to be happening tomorrow. Okay. We're going to pray for you. Would you make your way down the uh, middle aisle? Let's all stand up. If a couple of you would gather around them there in the aisle. Lord, we lift up to you Dave and Amanda and their four kids. We want to commit them to you as they move up to Traverse City. Thank you for the time they spent here at Lake Point and the fellowship we've had with them and their family and their kids. As we send them on your, their way, we trust that you will go with them. You will be with them in this new house, at the new job. Uh, we ask that you'd help them to find a great church in the area. And uh, we pray that those kids would continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus and that they would have Sunday school teachers and Awana leaders that would uh, just take them in uh, as they uh, find a new church in the area. So thank you for this time of fellowship. It's bittersweet, but we do commend them to you and ask for your blessing as they move, including uh, packing up and traveling up and get, just getting situated in the new place. Thank you. You are good, Lord, and we thank you for that always. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a real life minute now by a friend of mine named Crystal Johnson. Okay, um, so I wanted just to share with you something um, kind of funny and um, that I've enjoyed the last three months. Um, so I won't have anything to do about kidney. My kids will be so impressed that I did a real life minute and I never mentioned the word kidney, right? Yeah, good. So uh, I did. Um, <laughs> um, so about um, three months ago, well, first of all, some of you may know that I like to train dogs. So since I was about 12 years old, I've been training dogs on and off. Um, I like to train a certain breed of dog. It's called a Belgian Tavern. Um, they are a German Shepherd-like looking dog, and they were developed in Belgium, um, bred to herd sheep. So um, I've done all kinds of dog training, tracking, herding, I mean, sorry, tracking, obedience, rally, but I've never done herding. And so a few months ago, um, a friend of mine at my dog training club asked me if I would be interested in taking my Belgian Tavern Willow to learn to train to herd sheep. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds kind of fun. Never done that before. So I took an online class. I taught Willow how to do some fundamental commands in herding and um, watch some podcasts. Yeah, there are podcasts out there on dog training. I know it's kind of odd. Um, and... Um, and thought I was pretty prepared for this. And then about two weekends ago, I went and spent um, a whole weekend in Pickney at a sheep farm. And for six hours a day, we trained, went to a beginner sheep handler and sheep dog training clinic. And they flew a trainer in who trained eight of us how to train our sheep dog, sheep dog, and to train us. And it was a lot of fun. But there are two things that I learned. One, is sheep are not smart. <laughs> and two, being a shepherd is a ton of work. So um, I did all this prep work, and I thought I was pretty ready. I grew up on a, a small farm, so I'd been around sheep before. But um, my four-year-old Belgian Tavern Willow had never seen a sheep before, so I was a little anxious about that. So we get in this field with 10 sheep and um, an instructor, and surprisingly, I have no idea now what to do with my herding stick, and I can't remember which way is clockwise, clockwise and which way is counterclockwise command, but thankfully, God has given my dog, Willow, some instinctive ability to know how to keep these sheep together and how to move them so they don't scatter all over. I learned two things about sheepdog training that, that is way different than any kind of dog training I've ever done. So I'm gonna bore you a little bit with this. But one is, when you train a dog, you are always training them to focus on you. You want them to look at you, you want them to respond to you with either a hand signal or a command. But in sheepdog training, your dog's focus is the sheep. They are focused on that sheep, you are kind of in the peripheral, but they are focused on that sheep because they are reading the sheep all the time. 
So if you ever watch a video of, of sheepdogs, they are constantly watching the sheep. They are listening to a whistle or command, but they are constantly watching that sheep. And in sheepdog training, you have this imaginary bubble, we call it, that is fluid. It kind of moves with the sheep and the herd and the situation. But the dog is reading this bubble, and as he moves or moves his eyes or puts distance between or away from the, the sheep or the bubble, he can move the sheep a certain direction at a certain speed in a certain turn. If he moves too fast, he gets too close into the bubble, then the bubble pops and the sheep scatter all over the place. So while you can't see the bubble, the dog innately knows that there is a bubble. So the second thing that's really different about sheepdog training than any other kind of dog training I've ever done is that there is no rewarding the dog while you're training. So you know how you train a dog to sit or to shake, and then you give it a treat, or you say, good dog, or you say, you give him a toy. Um, in sheepdog training, if you watch a video, they're not, we're not out there saying, good dog, yay, yay. We don't give any treats, we don't give any toys. Because in sheepdog training, the reward is the work. I hope U of M never hears me say that. <laughs> but the reward is the work. So the reward for Willow is moving the sheep. That's the reward. In fact, the very hardest thing for her to do, or any sheepdog to do, is the command, lie down. So we say it all the time. Lie down, lie down, be still, lie down. And that's hard because that's not rewarding. That's not moving the sheep. But you, it's important, right? We need to be still. The dog needs to be still. It needs to lie down if I want the sheep to stop. Or if I want to turn the sheep, I have to have the dog lie down first so the, stop, the sheep stop moving and then turn. So it's, it's interesting because the only time I really reward my dog is at the end when I say, to me, and she comes to me, and then I say, that'll do. That'll do. That's the best thing. That's the best praise for a sheepdog. That'll do. So remember, sheep are not smart, and shepherd work is really hard work. And one of the reasons it's really hard is because you have all these terms you have to remember. Um, so one of them is um, when you get to a herd of sheep in a field, um, the first thing I do is I tell her, get around. And she runs out, and then she arcs around the sheep, because if she runs right at the sheep, they go all over the place. She's like, get around. And then when she gets out to the sheep and she's behind them, I say two things. I can say clockwise circle or counterclockwise circle. So I can say, come by, or I can say, away to me. But you don't use your hands, because remember the dog, not looking at you, looking at the sheep. So it's all either by whistle or command. Come by, away to me. Anyway, so those are just some of the commands and terminology I had to learn. But there's two concepts that I learned that God has actually been working on my heart about. The one is, there's this concept in herding called the draw. So when you have a field and you have your sheep out there, they have a draw. So the draw is different with different sheep in different times. But for example, it can often be the gate. And that's where the sheep really want to be. They want to be right there. Or sometimes it's a corner of the field where they feel safe. The draw is a safe place for them. Also the place they don't want to move from. So sometimes if they see sheep in another field, they'll want to be at that side of the pasture, and that's their draw. So it, it's, you have to know where the draw is. The dog has to know where the draw is. The shepherd has to know where the draw is. So you can help to direct them in the right area. It makes me think about what is my draw. What draws me in my life, in my spiritual life? And what should draw me? And then the second concept that I found so interesting is when you're a shepherd, you divide your sheep into two types, light sheep and heavy sheep. Now, it has nothing to do with their size, has nothing to do with how, how much they weigh. Light sheep are sheep that are prone to wander. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> prone to scatter, that just willy-nilly will just all of a sudden go off in another direction. Those are light sheep, and they are difficult to herd. Heavy sheep, or what we call sticky sheep, are sheep that want to be with the shepherd. They, they feel they are peaceful and calm, and 
and settled when they are by their shepherd. Those are heavy sheep or sticky sheep. So for beginner trainers and dogs, we work with heavy sheep, right? We want to make it as easy as possible for us to keep the sheep together. Um, when I think about the shepherds in the Christmas story, I just have such a better understanding and more empathy towards them than I did before. We worked six hours in the field each day. It was cold, it was raining, I was dressed appropriately, but I was mud. No, it wasn't just mud, if you can think about this. I was covered with mud and other things from head to toe both days. Um, but I got to go home, had a hot shower, got clean clothes, went back the next day. The Bethlehem shepherds didn't get to do that. Um, they had to work hard to keep their light sheep together. They were dirty, they were smelly. But those are the people that God chose to send the angels to, to invite to worship the birth of his son. And that speaks to me, I think. And the other thing I'm convicted of is the idea of being a sticky sheep. So I read the last few weeks, I've been reading all the verses that have sheep in them. Remember, sheep are not smart. And when you read the Bible, Jesus is the shepherd, but who's the sheep? Yeah. So I've just been convicted to try to ask God to help me be a sticky sheep. Help me be one that is drawn to my shepherd, that wants to feel peace and calmness near my shepherd. And at the end, I hope my shepherd says, that'll do, that'll do. Um, I'm going to be singing a song for y'all today. Um, it's a really beautiful song, and I was thinking about it in the 845 service. Um, Job was brought up a lot, and he says in the book of Job, Jesus is my redeemer. Um, and this song is about, it's a reminder of who God is and how important he is in our lives. Um, it's called God Who Saves. Um, um, so just be thinking about that as you're listening to this song. met my maker He said don't you take her She ain't started yet and kissed her baby's head I thought I'd never hold her Or see my face grow older You said you were there came undone, the longer the night, the brighter the sun. You're the God of coming home. You're the God of mending bones. You're the God of rescue songs. I will call out your name. God who saves. gave up trying Thought your voice went quiet In the dark and still I still trust your will To sing You're the That ancient wood 
sad my fears, my doubts, my unbelief at the end of myself was your hand. You're the God of coming home. You're the God of mending bones. You're the God of rescue songs. I will call out your name. God who saves This God who saves calls, calls us in our brokenness, in our hurt, in our pain. We're going to sing, oh, come to the altar. And it's going to, we're going to start by singing these words. Are you hurting? and Are you broken within? Are you overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Because Jesus is calling. So come. Jesus is calling. You know, we'll say, leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come. Leave those things behind. Jesus is calling. The God who saves is calling. Come, bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. Jesus is coming. Jesus is calling. And then come, sing hallelujah. Come, bow down, for he is Lord. At the very end, come, bear your cross as you wait for the crown. And come, tell the world of the treasure you found. This God who saves is calling. Will you sing with us? I'm just going to reflect on these words. You can stay seated for this song. But Jesus is calling, will you come? See 
a new song called Banner, and I want to read Psalm 20, verse 5 first, and it says, May we shout for joy over your victory, God, and lift up banners in the name of our God. We're going to sing, There's only one who is worthy. There's only one who overcomes, who will never fail. Light of the world everlasting. This is Jesus who's come down to earth that we're celebrating this season. Light of the world, everlasting Jesus, you are Lord of all. And then in the bridge, we're going to sing, So let our praise build an altar to Christ forever and no other. Jesus, may your name be the banner that is over us. So will you stand with us as we begin this song? Lord, you are greatly to be praised, and your faith. sadness come with your broken hearts and let rescue begin come lay down your burdens because there is hope and that hope is at Christ's table come out of sadness from wherever you've been come broken hearted let rescue Sinner, come near. And earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't
There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste of the grace. There's rest for the weary, a rest that endures. And earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So they come to you now. We know, God, that you are maker of all things. We know that we are rebels to your will at heart, but that you have offered us grace through your, through your son, Jesus. Lord, we come to you broken in need of a healer. We come to you um, as sinners redeemed by grace in need of your mercy every single day. God, we kneel down before you. Will you open our hearts up to what you have to say to us today, Lord? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be All right, thank you, praise team, and uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Eliana. And dear, thank you for your real life minute. I don't know if you heard this, but last night when the guys were returning the animals from the living nativity, the two sheep got away. The uh, big white sheep that we had, which were pretty stupid when they were right out there. Um, (laughs) When they, they were returning them to the farm, they got out. They opened the wrong door and they... Ran. If you want to hear more about this, talk to Caleb Yonker and Scott Bloomfield. I'll tell you about those sheep. They were ornery, too. They were what you call light sheep. Hey, everybody's going to need one of these. Do you all have one of these? Um, hey, Steve Broder, will you uh, grab a bunch of these from the back table and just walk through the middle aisle? Because if you don't have one of these, you're going to need one. And uh, just raise your hand, and he'll give you one. This Christmas season uh, here at Lake Point, we've been commemorating Jesus' birth, uh, his coming to earth, not as just one holiday, but as five connected holidays on different aspects of that one big event, which is uh, Jesus coming to earth. And uh, it is meant to um, kind of uh, reflect the, uh, the seven Jewish festivals or holy days that we studied when we studied uh, Leviticus this fall, and uh, some of those uh, holy days are connected. They celebrate different aspects of the same event. And so um, with that idea, this Christmas, we are selling the, the, what we're calling the festivals of Christmas. And uh, these are them. Now, these are just made-up holidays. We made these up for ourselves this, uh, this Christmas season. Back on November 26, we celebrated what we called the Fast of Necessity, and we wore black, and uh, we fasted that day. And we focused on why it was necessary that God sent a Savior. And the reason is that we're all broken. We're not good people. We're all broken. We can't heal ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. We needed a Savior. Uh, Then on December 3rd, uh, we celebrated the Day of Mercy. And we just uh, envisioned the day where God decided what he was going to do when he looked at our brokenness, our waywardness, our rebellion against him. And uh, he had options. He could have just said, oh, I'm done with those people and wiped everybody out. 
Or he could have just said, I'm leaving them on their own in our sin. He could have just left us in our sin. He did have a choice what he was going to do, and he chose to send us a Savior to begin to heal us and heal this broken world and restore us back to how we were meant to live in relationship with him. Uh, now, today is December 17th. Today is the beginning of the week of responses. We're gonna, we've already sung about that this morning. We're going to talk about that more in just a minute. Let me tell you that December 24th, next Sunday, is what we're calling the Feast of All Nations. We're going to focus on the fact that the gospel and Jesus and his church are not just for the descendants of Abraham anymore. For, they're for all people, all nations, all ethnicities. And we're going to talk about what does that mean as we live as Christians in this world and at, in a church, that the church is meant for all people, all races, all ethnicities. That's what we'll do next Sunday morning. And then next Sunday evening is our, uh, our Christmas Eve service, and we're calling that the Night of Light. All right, today is the Day of Responses. Um, over my lifetime, I have heard a lot of presentations about different religions and philosophies in the world. Just in my life, I've heard a lot of different uh, presentations about uh, what's out there, and maybe you have too, uh, different religions, different philosophies of life. Uh, like um, once I toured a uh, Mormon visitor center, and I heard their presentation as they tried to win me to the, the Mormon faith. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I've read a book on Buddhism. Very interesting. Um, one time when I lived in New York City, I went to the world headquarters of the Unification Church and, uh, and sat through a lecture there. That's Reverend Sun Young Moon's uh, church as they tried to persuade me that he was the returned Messiah. It was very interesting. Um, I have a Hindu friend who explained Hinduism to me one time. I've read the Koran. Anyways, every time I have one of those experiences, I have a decision, right? And this would be true of you too. Anytime you hear a truth claim in the world, you have a decision, and the decision is how will you respond? Uh, you have to consider, it, it, does this ring true? Does this fit reality as I understand it? And your response has to include the idea, would I base my life on this? More than that, would I base my eternity on what I'm hearing? We have to respond. And so I just find that so interesting as we think about our need to respond, because you know that to not respond is to respond, right? You have to respond to any truth claims you hear in the world. And it's so interesting then when we come to the Christmas season that... Um, you know, there are birth accounts of Jesus recorded in Matthew and in Luke. They describe Jesus being born in Bethlehem. But along with those birth accounts in Matthew and Luke, it records how people responded to this claim that he was the Son of God, come from heaven to save us and the world. And so it's just, it's fascinating to read Matthew and to Luke and, Luke and realize it's not just giving us a, a story about what happened, it's telling us how people responded. Did they accept it? Did they believe it? Did it change anything about their lives? And that's the question ultimately that we're asking this morning. How do you respond to the claims of the Christmas story and has it changed your life? So um, in this booklet that you have, it describes 10 different people or groups of people and um, how they responded. And for, if you look inside the book, for each of these, I've written just kind of three questions that we're going uh, to answer. The first one is, what were that person's like options? Like when we talk about Joseph. Well, when Joseph heard the claim of the angel, what were his options about what, how he could respond? I think it's healthy for us not just to look at how he did respond, but how could he have responded, hypothetically? And then we're going to ask the second question, well, what was his response? How did he respond? What does the Bible describe as being what he actually did in response to that? And then just kind of a third question of what's the lesson here for me? I don't want to just be academic and read a, a narrative. I want to know what difference is this going to make in my life today. And so for each of these uh, 
uh, people and groups, we're going to ask these three questions. And here's what we're going to do. We are going to do three of these right now. Okay, we're going to do three of them, and then I'm going to ask you to take this booklet with you for the rest of the week, and the rest of the week I'd like you to do the other seven and read the passages and um, write in the booklet um, what were the options the person had, how did they respond, and what's the lesson here for me. All right, any questions with me so far? All right, the first one I want to do is number one, and that is Joseph's response. So find uh, number one, Joseph's response. Uh, we read about Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. You see it's recorded there in, their, uh, in the booklet. And I need a volunteer who would read this right out of the booklet for us. A volunteer who would read the passage right there. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a vision, a dream, and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Thanks, Jamie. So Joseph was engaged to a young woman from his hometown of Nazareth named Mary, and it's actually more than engaged, isn't it? They were betrothed, which is a legal category. To break a betrothal required writing a certificate of divorce. So it was more than the fact that they were engaged. They had not yet come together sexually yet, though, but um, they're committed legally to each other. But then all of a sudden, Mary's pregnant. And uh, Joseph naturally, he didn't want to marry a young woman who was pregnant with a baby that wasn't his. And so he has in mind that he's going to write her a certificate of divorce, but he doesn't want to be too mean to her, so he's going to do it quietly. And then an angel appears, and he says, uh, don't fear, Joseph. Still take Mary as your wife, and um, what is her is in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she's going to give birth to Yeshua, the Savior of mankind. All right, so at this point, then, let's ask this question. What were Joseph's options here about what he would do? And what I mean is not just what were his options to do, his actions, like he could have still divorced Mary. But I mean, like, what are his emotional options? Because it's our emotions, what we're coming, what's going on inside our, what the Bible calls our hearts, that results in our actions. So it just seems to me that one option Joseph had was just fear. Um, like, I don't have control of this. I can't go through with this. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Do you ever have fear about something because you don't know how it's going to turn out? Joseph didn't know for sure how it was going to turn out. This has never happened in my experience. And uh, I think it would be very natural that he would just fear. I can't go through with this, God. Not me. This is too far beyond me, God. Could have responded in fear. It seems that he could have responded in doubt. I don't think this is of God, because God doesn't do this kind of thing. He's never done it before. I don't think God is in this, and I'm safer not going along this with what I'm being asked to do. And it seems to me that um, uh, another option he had was to worry about his reputation. I think this is what I would have done. What are the guys going to think? What's my family going to think if my fiance is pregnant and I still marry her? I'm going to be a fool for the rest of my life. Everybody's going to remember this about me. Uh, he could have worried about his reputation. Um, well, what was 
Joseph's response, though? How did he respond? Not just what did he do, but again, what was his emotional response? Wasn't it uh, like faith or trust? What's the difference? What's the opposite of fear? The angel says, Joseph, don't fear. Well, what's the opposite of fear? It seems to me it's faith. It's trust in God. Not trust in your own ability. Not trust in your strength to make it happen. But trust in God's word and his promises. And that God is going to do this. Do you have that kind of faith? Um, He chose to believe the angel's words that the child was actually Emmanuel, God with us. Joseph's choice uh, of faith results in him going ahead with the marriage to Mary, accepting the child as his own, and naming the baby Yeshua, Yahweh saves. So, Anyways, then I asked myself, well, what's the lesson here for me? And this isn't the right answer for, for you. Just as I was thinking about this story, I thought, what's it saying to me? And you have to ask that, what's it saying to you? And for me, it just seems when it comes to the things of God, I will often be tempted to fear and doubt and worry about my reputation. So much of what God does, this is the temptation for how I want to respond. Um, Real obedient faith doesn't come naturally. It's a difficult decision. It requires trust in the unseen. That's not natural. It's a decision you have to make in how you respond to the claims of God. Um, and then I said, it often won't make sense to others, you know, to family members, friends. And vindication of the truth will probably not come immediately, which is what that makes it faith. It just seems to me that this is something that I can take from how Joseph responded. Now, again, Joseph's not the hero of the story. God is the hero of the story but he uses this man who yields himself in faith to God's work. Anybody want to add anything to that? Want to add anything to what you would uh, write in? All right, well, let's go to another one then. Let's go to number three. This is Zachariah's response. Number three, Zachariah's response. Zachariah was John the Baptist's dad. And he has just been told that he and his wife are going to have a son who will be the forerunner of the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior from God. His story is in Luke chapter 1. And can I have a volunteer who will read that portion? Do you want to read? Pass that down, will you? Hold on, I'm not hearing that on the, is it still on? Yeah, see there's an on button there? Yeah, please. There you go. Okay. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant of David. And he said through his holy prophet, Of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Zacharias has heard from an angel here. How does he respond? Well, this is his prayer. This is his pronouncement. Um, What were Zacharias's um, options on how he would respond? Well, it seems to me one is to focus on the wrong thing. And here's what I mean by that. Um, Zacharias and his wife, whose name is Elizabeth, are fairly elderly at this point, and they've just been told they're going to have a son. And he is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Now, I think I would be so excited about, oh, I've never been able to have kids, but now all of a sudden I am. But that would be 
to focus on the wrong thing, wouldn't it? Um, you know, it's a blessing from God that they are going to have a son, but that's not the whole point of the, this message. You're going to have a son, and he's going to be the one who introduces people to the Messiah. There's your, your main point. And it just seems that sometimes, especially at Christmas time, we can focus on the wrong things. Anybody do that? Oh, we do that so often. We focus on the wrong things. All the gatherings, all the gifts, all the pressure and stress that comes from focusing on those things. What if we were to focus on the right thing, that God has sent me a Savior that can heal my soul? It was an option that Zechariah could focus on the wrong thing. Um, now, Zacharias is happy, but he doesn't make that the main thing. He realizes that the work of God in the world is the main thing. Um, we focus on the things of this earth too much rather than on, on eternal things. You know what I think would have been an option too for Zacharias was fear for his son. Why? Do you think about that? He's just been told that your son is the one who's going to announce to the world that a Messiah, a new king, has come. Well, a new king, but we have a king, and he is Caesar. And our land is occupied by Roman soldiers, and you want my son to stand up and tell everybody that there's a new king? That's going to be dangerous for him. I'm not sure I want my kids doing dangerous things in the world. I want them to live safely. I want them to stay near me. I don't want them to do this type of thing. Can you get somebody else? I know it's a good thing that a Savior is coming, but not my kids. I want my kids safe. Parents, we do this all the time. Sometimes a God is calling them somewhere, and your kid is bold enough to go, but you're saying, oh, no, I want you to stay close. I want you to stay safe. Well, the work of God is not always safe. You know, I got a daughter living in Tijuana, Mexico. And if you want to talk about an opportunity to worry about your daughter, uh, there it is. She's working with sex workers and she works with migrants in the camps who are applying for asylum uh, to cross the border. And she goes to dangerous places all the time and we commit her to the Lord and we're thankful that God has chosen to use her for something so important as sharing the gospel and spreading light to people who desperately need it. And when we start to worry, that's when we pray. And she will be back this week, so we'll get to see her next Sunday. Because it's safe here, nothing bad can happen here. <laughs> what was Zacharias's response, though? What was his response here? Well, first of all, it was to recognize people's and his need of salvation and that Jesus would provide it. Look at verse 69. He said, God is sending us salvation, and that's what we need. He said, and I need it. And, and so another thing that I see him um, responding with is to recognize that salvation includes serving God and living lives of holiness. When he says this in verse 74, he's going to rescue us from the hand of our enemies. He says it's going to result in us not living in fear, but in living in holiness and uh, in righteousness before him. Having salvation is going to result in a change in my life. Um, Sometimes I wonder, do I realize that Christmas and trusting this Savior needs to result in holiness and in righteousness in my own life as I try to glorify the one who's healing me? Well, what's the lesson for me? Again, this isn't the right answer for everyone, but this is just what I took from the story. First of all, I need to look for the grand plan of what God is doing in history. Oh, I just get so caught up with the little details of my life. But God was saying, you know, Zacharias, this is a big deal what's going to go on. Yeah, I know it's your son, but he's introducing the Messiah. I need to make sure that I'm not so focused on my little world that I realize that God is doing amazing things throughout this world. And then another lesson that I thought of for me is uh, don't think first of the safety of my children. Rejoice in how God is using them. And that's a challenge for all of the parents that are in the room. All right, anybody want to add anything with Zacharias? Any other thoughts? All right, then I want us to go to number eight. Number eight, which is Simeon. Simeon's response. Number eight, there was a man 
who uh, apparently lived in Jerusalem. His name was Simeon. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. Wouldn't you love to get a promise like that from God? Like, if God would just tell you, you're not going to die until Jesus returns and you see him, wouldn't you appreciate that if God would, would do for you what he did for Simeon? Uh, well, one day, the Holy Spirit prods Simeon to go to the temple. I don't know if he tells him why. I don't know if he says, hey, it's time. Go to the temple and see the Messiah. Or if the Holy Spirit just says, get up and go to the temple. So anyways, that story is in uh, Luke 2. And pass that back down. Who will read for us the passage from Luke 2? All right, Melody. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, when you have prepared, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Thanks, Melody. What were Simeon's options? One that I thought of is just despair, because he's been waiting a long time. He's old. Like, oh Lord, how long? Have you ever tempted to despair? Like, God, I've been going through this a long time. How long do you expect me to wait? How long do I have to wait? Um, Another option I thought of is just loneliness. And it just strikes me this way that Simeon seems like he's alone. It doesn't mention his wife. It doesn't mention any kids. He's an old man waiting for something. It just seems like he could have been very lonely as he's waiting for God's promises. And then another possible response, I thought it was just doubt. I don't know if this is God. I know I've been waiting. I don't know if this thing is of God. Um, It's easier for me to just stay home and keep waiting. But that's not his response. His response is hope. And when the Bible uses the word hope, it means something more like expectation. You know, when we look at what he says as he's holding baby Jesus in his arms, he says, "Um, my eyes have seen your salvation. Really, all he's seen is an eight-day-old baby, right? (laughs) But he says, my eyes have seen your salvation now. You can dismiss me now in peace because I know where I'm going, and I know who's going to get me there. A light to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. And he's saying, now I've got hope. I've got assurance about my future. So instead of doubt, what he does is he finds hope for the future. What do you have if you don't have hope in Christ? Well, here's a lesson for me. Again, these are just what I thought about this story is don't give in to despair while waiting for God to reveal himself because I think that's easy to do. The world just goes on the way it is and so many terrible things happen and it seems like God doesn't intervene. Don't give in to despair. Um, Believe that Jesus has come once and he will come again. If I can believe Jesus came once, I don't have any trouble believing that he is going to come a second time. And then one more. Uh, Remember that God rejoices to you, old people, in his revelation. You know, those of us that are getting old, Simeon was old. And uh, he's the one who God says, go to the temple and make this pronounce that the Messiah is here. And everybody who hears you, and they're going to record it in the Bible for the rest of, you know, eternity until I return, they're going to remember you're the one who made it clear who this baby was. All right, anybody want to add anything? All right, then, uh, just as we get ready to wrap up, I just want to say something about number 10. You see how number 10 is your response. You're going to read from uh, John chapter 1. Um, I I guess I want to just say, don't, please don't gloss over that too quickly. When it asks for your response to Jesus coming to earth, don't just say, oh, I believe. But let's think more deeply about this, like what difference does it make it in my mind 
and in how I'm living my life if God has sent me a Savior to heal my brokenness. Is your brokenness being healed? Is there something more you need? Do you need prayer from the leaders of the church? Do you need someone to come alongside of you and help you in this journey that is faith? Um, how are you responding? So give some thought as you fill that out. Um, next Sunday, the Feast of All Nations. So uh, we'll gather for that. So we're kind of over time. You all right if we, where's Gloria? You all right if we don't do a closing song? Let's close with this. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. Let me remind you about the service project we're going to do afterwards if you can stay. And thanks. We're dismissed.